Greetings and welcome to Word Magazine. This is Jeff Riddle, pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. Today is Saturday, August the 29th of 2020. In this episode of Word Magazine, number 174, we're going to be continuing our survey of the life of Jerome, a very important early Christian thinker and writer and scholar of Scripture. And I began this overview of Jerome's life in the last Word Magazine, Word Magazine 173. And as I noted in that uh, episode, I am basically following giving a review of a noteworthy uh, biography of Jerome by J.N.D. Kelly that's titled Jerome, His Life, Writings, and Controversies. And this biography was originally published in 1975, and I'm drawing on a 1980 reprint of that work. And as I noted last time, I have about 16 pages of notes uh, from this book that I uh, have jotted down. And in part one, I covered about the first five pages. So I'm hoping today that we're going to cover the last 10 pages of those notes. And uh, that means I may try to go a little more quickly through reading some of the materials so we don't belabor things too long. Uh, Last time, we sort of noted, first of all, that Kelly, the biographer, uh, although he uh, is very much uh, admiring of Jerome for many things, uh, on the other hand, he has sort of a negative assessment of Jerome's rather prickly personality. Uh, Also in the last episode, in part one, we covered the first stage of Jerome's uh, life. That is from his birth and his early years, especially uh, his early years as a student and first becoming a Christian in Rome, uh, beginning with his birth in Striden and Dalmatia in the year around the year 331, up to the year 386, where he left Rome and went with some female companions who were his students, most notably uh, a noble uh, widow woman, a wealthy woman named Paula and her daughter Eustochium. And they had traveled to the Holy Land, to Palestine, had visited uh, the various religious sites. And eventually they decided that they would settle down in Bethlehem. So in this Uh, Second part of our survey of Jerome's life, we could call it a survey of his life from Bethlehem to his death, or from the year 386 to the year 420. So let's go ahead and see if we can resume this survey of Jerome's life. So in three years, from 386 to 389, Two monastic houses, one for women and one for men, were built in Bethlehem under Jerome's guidance and with Paula's purse uh, supplying uh, what was needed for the construction of these houses. As well, uh, they also built a hospice uh, in Bethlehem for travelers. That was seemed to be fitting given that uh, Mary and Joseph were not able to find room in the inn when Christ was born in Bethlehem, and so uh, they uh, constructed there a hospice for travelers. The women's house stood alongside the Church of the Nativity, a church that had been built over the supposed site where Christ had been born, and uh, Jerome and Paula, as sort of celebrity leaders of these communities, attracted Uh, members who wanted to come and join with them in this monastic enterprise. Jerome was busy at this stage with teaching and with uh, giving administration to these uh, communities. He also took up, according to Kelly at this time, a period of prodigious, sometimes feverish, literary activity. Uh, Kelly notes also that he continued to be plagued by problems with his eyes, 
but was able to use funds that were given him by Paula and others to hire stenographers and copyists in order to keep up with his grueling writing schedule. One of the things that he did at this period was he translated uh, into Latin the work by Didymus the Blind uh, from Alexandria, his work on the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he also translated various homilies by origin on the Gospel of Luke. And we noted uh, last time how uh, Jerome's Latin translations of origin were important uh, for uh, keeping uh, some of these things in print uh, because a lot of the Greek originals were destroyed when Origen's theology uh, lost favor in the Christian world. Uh, Kelly notes that uh, Jerome was particularly interested in translating these homilies of Origen because he thought that they contained material that opposed some of the ideas of Ambrose of Milan, and he notes that Jerome, for some unexplained reason, had uh, a grievance, did not get along well with Ambrose of Milan, and so he was intent to find things to counteract his teaching. Uh, Kelly notes that uh, it was in this period of time, uh, now he's in his mid-50s, uh, Jerome was begin, beginning to present himself before the public as uh, an influential uh, Bible commentator. And so people look to Jerome for his interpretation, uh, for uh, his explanations of biblical difficulties and so forth. And so he set himself again in, on this grueling uh, writing regimen. And part of that was to produce commentaries. Uh, he produced commentaries um, in the early Bethlehem years on Galatians, on Ephesians, on Titus, and on Philemon. And uh, Kelly points out that in these early commentaries on the Pauline epistles, it's very easy to see the influence of origins, exegesis, and hermeneutics in uh, Jerome's work. Kelly says that in his commentaries on Galatians and Ephesians, uh, Jerome defended the idea of Christian holy days. He complained about elaborate church music of his day and argued that in the primitive churches, there had been a plurality of elders. Uh, he also noted, Kelly noted, that Jerome uh, downplayed the conflict between Paul and Peter uh, in Galatians 2. Jerome then left the Pauline epistles and began a commentary on the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, spurred as he was by his interest in Hebrew. Uh, Kelly notes that, again, uh, he was influenced by Origen in the way that uh, he saw the so-called wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Kelly says that for Jerome, Proverbs was for children, Ecclesiastes was for adults, and the Song of uh, songs or the Song of Solomon was for the elderly, with each reflecting respectively ethics, physics, and logic. Uh, Jerome also completed uh, three uh, so-called dryly technical works on Hebrew, the Hebrew language, and the Old Testament. Uh, one of those was an etymological dictionary of biblical proper names, this is sometimes referred to as the Hebrew names or by the Greek title, the Onomastikon. He also produced um, a gazetteer of places mentioned in the scriptures, and it's, that is sometimes referred to as the Book of Places. And he also produced a critical examination of difficult passages in the Book of Genesis under the title of Hebrew Questions. Like others of his era, uh, Jerome held that Hebrew was the original speech of mankind uh, and that before the Tower of Babel that uh, Hebrew had been uh, the universal uh, human language. In the book Hebrew Questions, Jerome expressed his distrust of the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, and uh, he maintained his preference for the Hebrew verity, the Hebraica veritas. 
So again, this is a very important uh, thing about uh, Jerome's scholarship that he stressed that uh, the Old Testament uh, should be understood in the Hebrew original and should be translated from the Hebrew original when it was translated into other languages. By the year 390, Jerome embarked on a complete translation of the Old Testament from the Hebrew original into Latin. Kelly says that he did this in part to respond to Jewish critics, apologetics that he had with uh, Jews that he had come into contact with. His preference for the Hebrew also impacted his view of the canon of Scripture as he rejected the so-called ecclesiastical books that were included in the Septuagint as apocryphal and believed that only the books that were originally written in Hebrew and accepted by Jews as part of the Old Testament, that, that Christians should only receive them. Though he uh, claimed uh, in his uh, work called The Lives of Famous Men, which was written around the year 392, that he had completed his Old Testament translation by that time, Kelly says that this sweeping claim must be taken with reserve, and Kelly suggests that, he, that Jerome probably did not complete uh, the, his translation of the Old Testament into Latin until around the years 405 or 406. Uh, Kelly calls Jerome's translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew his crowning literary achievement. And Kelly adds, uh, by a gradual process extending from the 6th to the 9th century, it, meaning the Latin Vulgate translation of Jerome, was to become accepted with the rest of the New Testament revised by an unknown hand or hands as the standard or Vulgate Latin text of the Bible, and as such to exert an incalculable influence not only on piety but on the language and literature of Western Europe. It's interesting, again, Kelly holds that Although Jer Jerome did translate the Gospels, but uh, he cast doubts as to whether Jerome translated the rest of the Old Testament. But he says Jerome did the entirety of the Old Testament from Hebrew. And again, this um, uh, later became known as the Latin Vulgate and then uh, was accepted in the West as the standard edition of the Bible. And so it had a huge influence, again, on the language and literature of Western Europe. Though noting that Jerome took immense pains to make uh, sure uh, to ensure the accuracy of this translation, and uh, noting that modern students agree it is uh, in general very faithful, Kelly notes four issues with Jerome's Old Testament translation. This is on page 162 of his biography, and so the four issues he raises about Jerome's translation. Uh, are number one, his use of frequent interpolations. Second, his rewriting of passages that he thought were difficult or inconsistent. So he attempted, rather than just translate what was there in the Hebrew, to try to smooth it out, to try to harmonize. Uh, third, uh, uh, Kelly says he took greater liberties uh, with books that he translated later. And he points out that the book of Judges, in particular in the Latin Vulgate, is essentially a paraphrase. And fourth, uh, Kelly notes that some passages uh, were in the Old Testament translation were given a much more pointedly messianic uh, interpretation by Jerome. And so these were some of the problems with the, uh, the Latin Vulgate Old Testament translation. And uh, so, again, I think that that's noteworthy, and this is why, um, you know, Protestants certainly would point to some of these things as evidence of why the Vulgate cannot be the standard edition of the Bible and that the standard is the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament. Kelly says that uh, Jerome made use of a special type of Christian Latin, as he puts it, he says that uh, um, in Jerome's translation of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch stands out as supreme, while the book of Job uh, is considered to be the least satisfactory. 
And we already mentioned um, a sort of a negative assessment of the book of Judges as well. Next, Jerome undertook uh, commentaries on five of the minor prophets, Nahum, Micah, Zephaniah, Haggai, and Habakkuk. Uh, and it's pointed out that Jerome's commentaries didn't always follow an orderly canonical sequence, but he sort of did his, his commentaries in a sort of haphazard order. And this came about because he produced the commentaries upon the demands that were made uh, upon him by his friends. Um, they wanted to, they would ask him questions, and so he would produce a commentary. So if they asked about one particular book, if they asked about Nahum, he'd produce a commentary on Nahum. Um, also, it is pointed out by Kelly that, that Jerome's commentaries uh, included a mixture of both literal and what was typical for that age, allegorical interpretation. Jerome's new translation uh, of the Old Testament into Latin uh, caused him, according to Kelly, distress and indignation since it received an embittered reaction and he included prefaces to the various books he had translated where we see um, reflections of his distress and indignation as he received criticism uh, for uh, uh, his new translation, new at that time. Of course, it would later become the dominant translation uh, in the Roman church. More popular were his uh, works like The Life of Malchus, The Captive Monk, which was completed around the year 390 or 391. And he also uh, produced another biographical work that was quite popular that was titled The Life of Hilarion. Uh, Kelly uh, refers to these as propaganda literature as Jerome was writing these lives of these, uh, these um, monks in order to promote uh, propagandize in favor of the monastic life. Another work of propagandist history was uh, Jerome's aforementioned Lives of Famous Men in Latin, De Vivis Illustribus. And this was a work he completed in 392, and it incorporated biographies of key men in early Christianity, beginning with the Apostle Peter, as the first entry, and then the last entry was Jerome's own sort of autobiography of himself. Though it is an invaluable historical source, Kelly also sees this work by Jerome as reflecting some of his personal weaknesses in that, to use Kelly's words, it is defective in both originality and self-criticism, and all too often marred by partiality, carelessness, and unwillingness to take trouble. Uh, chapter 17 of Kelly's um, biography, there are 28 chapters total, but the 17th chapter is titled Champion of Chastity. And so he presents Jerome uh, as a champion of chastity. And this chapter is intriguing in that it, it uh, presents Jerome as one uh, who was always advocating for celibacy, for chastity, for asceticism, self-denial, and monasticism. And he saw definitely the monastic life, the celibate life, as the most desirable, highest sort of form of living the Christian life. And again, we, we'll see this later reflected in the Roman and the Western church which will have a celibate priesthood and uh, put much emphasis on uh, uh, monasticism, etc. Jerome's views during, in his day uh, were contested by a contemporary of his, a man named Jovian, who was in Rome. And there was a, uh, a sort of um, a contest between these two men with Jerome, uh, being an, a champion of chastity and Jovian questioning uh, some of the biblical and theological foundations for this teaching. 
Uh, Jerome uh, responded to Jovian uh, in a sort of a typical prickly type of manner. Uh, he called him the Epicurus of Christians. And Jerome wrote his, his lengthiest polemical work responding to Jovian, a work that is titled Against Jovian, in which uh, 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 Jerome attacks him. Kelly describes this work against Jero, uh, Jovian as one of Jerome's most effective productions. Uh, in that work, Jerome warned against indulgence. He's, he writes at one point, eating meat, drinking wine, having a well-filled belly, there you have the seedbed of lust. As a polemicist, Kelly says that Jerome was, quote, a hard-hitting fighter and did not mince words, end quote. The attack on Jovian, for example, uh, Kelly says, contains robustly libelous caricatures. In the end, Kelly says that Jerome's treatise against Jovian is, however, disappointing in that it relies on superficiality and personal attacks rather than addressing the substance of Jerome of Jovian's objections to extreme asceticism. Kelly notes that in a letter from this period, Jerome gave an allegorical interpretation of the Shunammite who warmed the aged David by sleeping with him, describing her as a, an allegory, a figure for wisdom. And this would be one example of Jerome retreating to allegorical interpretations rather than taking a literal interpretation uh, based on his previous sort of theological and practical presuppositions. With respect to polemics, one of Jerome's bitterest conflicts would develop over the theology of origin. And we mentioned earlier that Jerome had translated a number of the works of origin and even those influenced by Origen in that he translated Didymus the Blind's work on the Holy Spirit. But uh, the, the theology and the writings of Origen became controversial. Uh, his uh, Origen's works began to be denounced by various Orthodox bishops. One of those who led the charge against Origen was a man named Epiphanius, who was the Bishop of Salamis, Salamis, uh, whom Kelly describes as fanatical and anti-intellectual with a zeal for correct doctrine. Uh, this man, Epiphanius, saw Origen as an arch heretic and as the intellectual father of Arius. Um, and uh, Kelly does a nice job on page 197 of laying out what were the objections that uh, Orthodox men like Epiphanius had against Origen. And here are some of the, the things that they found troubling about Origen. First of all, they accused him of Trinitarian errors. Uh, they said that Origen said that the Son could not see the Father, and so the Holy Spirit could not see the Son. They also accused him of what we could call creation errors, in that Origen held that human souls had pre-existed as angelic spirits, and that they had been incarcerated in human bodies as a result of the fall. Origen uh, allegorically interpreted the coat of skins uh, with which Adam and Eve were clothed after the fall as being a reference to human bodies. And so apparently Origen was influenced not only by a Platonic thought, but also by Gnostic thought, um, having a, a, a predisposition towards the, against the physical. Uh, they also accused him of resurrection errors in that they said Origen held that at the resurrection men will not rise with bodies of flesh, but with ethereal spiritual bodies. And they accused him of universalism errors in that Origen held that eventually all men uh, would be saved. 
and that even the devil would in the end repent and be restored. Jerome sided with Epiphanius and the other more conservative Orthodox men. Uh, Jerome translated an epistle written by Epiphanius expressing some of his grievances with Origen and the battle really ensued between Epiphanius and the bishop in Jerusalem whose name was John. And uh, it's interesting in this letter 51 that Jerome translated, um, just as a little side note, uh, Epiphanius, in addition to his uh, critique of Origen, uh, he was also something of an iconoclast. And there's an interesting uh, discussion in that letter 51 in uh, paragraph 9 or section 9 where Epiphanius describes the removal and destruction of an image of Christ or of a saint that he saw on a curtain hanging on a church door. And he stopped and saw it and immediately had it removed and destroyed. Um, so it shows uh, the, the clash that was existing in early Christianity over the, the whole idea of um, images and icons. And of course, there was uh, at the forefront was a clash over the theology of origin at this time. Again, pitting Epiphanius, supported by Jerome against John of Jerusalem. And John of Jerusalem, uh, as we'll see, would be supported by uh, Jerome's old friend, Rufinus. One of the odd happenings at this time was that Jerome's younger brother, whose name was Paulinian, who at that time was, was only about 28 years old, had gone on a visit to Salamis from Bethlehem. And while he was there, he had been forcibly ordained by Epiphanius as a deacon and then in quick succession as a priest. And this was controversial, not only because he was sort of forced uh, into becoming a priest, but also in that he was from Bethlehem, he was under the jurisdiction or should have been under the jurisdiction of John of Jerusalem. And John became angered when he found out that uh, Jerome's brother had been ordained without his uh, permission and without his authority. And so John excommunicated Jerome and those in his monastic community. Uh, again, this heightened the conflict between Jerome and those in Jerusalem, in including the monastic community led by Rufinus. Eventually, uh, appeal was made to Theophilus, the bishop of Alexandria, to sort of mediate this conflict. And uh, by Easter of 397, Theophilus of Alexandria was able to bring about reconciliation among the opposing parties. Uh, between those who supported Epiphanius and those who supported John. And so they were reconciled and a peace was brokered. However, this peace would be short-lived and a new conflict uh, erupted again over origin and things would become exceedingly heated between Jerome and Rufinus. More about that later. During this time, Jerome also continued as a prolific letter writer, addressing questions about scripture that were posed to him by friends and acquaintances. He also wrote a number of works at this time, which Kelly describes as uh, threnodies, T-H-R-E-N-O-D-I-E-S, uh, threnodies or letters of consolation upon the death of someone. And so Jerome became a master of this. He would hear of people who had died, friends in Rome or in other places, and he would write long uh, con uh, consolatory letters uh, lamenting the death of the person and also making some theological, practical, or spiritual points along the way. It was also during this time that Jerome had the first of his correspondence with a young contemporary a bishop of North Africa known as Augustine of Hippo. And so Augustine was about 20 years younger than uh, Jerome. Uh, he lived from 354 to 430. And um, so this was their initial contact with one another by means of letter. 
uh, they, will, they will have uh, more extended conversations later. In the year 396, Jerome completed commentaries on the books of Jonah and Obadiah, as well as an exposition of the visions of Isaiah in Isaiah chapters 13 through 23. Uh, Kelly points out that in his commentaries, uh, these commentaries, Jerome took his normal approach, and that was a double translation. He translated the Hebrew, but he also would do a translation uh, from the Old Latin and from the Septuagint. And he also did a double exegesis in that he would first give a literal interpretation or a historical ter- interpretation, and then he would offer a spiritual or a tropological interpretation. So a double translation, the Hebrew, and then a, a translation that was based on the Old Latin slash Septuagint, and then a double exegesis, a, a literal or an historical reading, and then a spiritual or allegorical or tropological reading. Jerome accepted the book of Jonah as literal history, but he also saw it on a spiritual plane. He saw Jonah as a type of Christ. Uh, In the year 398, Jerome uh, wrote a commentary on the Gospel of Matthew at the request of a friend, and it is said that he completed this commentary at breakneck speed, writing it in just Uh, two weeks time. Kelly notes that Jerome expressed uh, in his commentary on Matthew and in his other writings on the Gospels very little interest in what is uh, known today as the synoptic problem, uh, trying to understand the literary relationship among the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Kelly adds that to Jerome it was clear that Matthew was the first of the three Gospels that it was originally written in Hebrew, and that it was intended for Jewish converts to Christianity. He also points out that Jerome's method was to seek interpretations that were harmonizing, uh, and that he also, in his commentary on Matthew in particular, had a sharp eye for pointing out various textual variants. Kelly notes that in this period of Jerome's life, by the late 390s, Uh, Jerome's life was also characterized by trouble and anxiety regarding uh, both his health, again, especially his eyes, and also mounting financial worries as the funds that had come from Paula that that initially built the houses, that began to run low. And so he was uh, always worrying about raising funds to continue the two religious houses that he had founded in Bethlehem. As noted, the conflict with his childhood friend Rufinus uh, also uh, intensified. The two men disagreed on the text of the Old Testament, uh, Jerome supporting the Hebrew, whereas Rufinus took what was then the more traditional Christian view that looked to the Old Latin and to the Septuagint. They also disagreed on the use of the pagan classics by Christians. Jerome approved the use of the old pre-Christian pagan philosophers and writers. Rufinus did not. And especially they clashed over Origen, as Jerome again had joined in denouncing Origen, whereas Rufinus uh, uh, argued uh, against those who were critical of origin. He he argued for the orthodoxy of origin and for um, the propriety of origin's method of handling the scriptures. The flashpoint for further controversy came when Rufinus, who was also a gifted scholar in his own right, translated into Latin an early work that had been compiled around the year 308 by Pamphilius, uh, who had been the mentor of Eusebius of Caesarea, and that work was titled A Vindication of Origen. This work, again, originally written in Greek by Pamphilius, was a collection of summaries and excerpts from Origen's teachings. And Rufinus uh, translated this into Latin, 
Uh, Kelly says that Rafinas would have known that by doing so, he would have been stepping into a minefield uh, because many now were considering Origen to be an arch heretic. Uh, Rafinas uh, wrote a preface to his translation of the work in which he defended the orthodoxy of Origen and suggested that perhaps some of Origen's works had even been falsely corrupted in order wrongly to present him as uh, giving heretical views. If that were not enough, in, around the year 398, Rufinus also began to translate Origen's classic work uh, on first principles. In defending his making of this translation, Rufinus subtly noted that Jerome had also translated many of Origen's uh, works, and he quoted uh, uh, a, a statement that had been made by Jerome much earlier in which Jerome had said that Origen stood second only to the apostles as a teacher of the church. This set off a storm of letter writing from Jerome uh, regarding the controversy as lines were drawn between the detractors of Origen and the defenders of Origen. Jerome also produced his own highly literal translation of On First Principles to counter the looser translation of Rufinus. And so he said, oh, you know, Rufinus is defending the orthodoxy of origin, but he took liberties in the translation, and I'm going to give you a literal translation so you'll know exactly what origin said and taught. The ecclesiastical politics soon solidified in favor of the anti-origin camp. And so Epiphanius and Jerome and their allies would eventually prevail, and the judgment of the church would be that Origen's teachings were not orthodox. The new bishop of Rome, named Anastasius I, uh, came out in opposition to Origen, uh, as did Theophilus, uh, the previous mentioned mediator, uh, the patriarch of the church at Alexandria, called by some the Pharaoh of Alexandria because of the authority and power that he had in Christianity in that day. Again, the, when the bishops of Rome and, and the bishop of Alexandria uh, team up together and come out in solid opposition to Origen, uh, this doesn't bode well for him, for Origen's writings, and for those who supported him. And Theophilus in particular began to harry uh, those who were expressing pro-Origen sentiments in his jurisdiction. Kelly says that Jerome became uh, Pharaoh's eager, uncritical collaborator during this period. When Rufinus defended himself in writing an apology to Anastasius, the Bishop of Rome. Jerome responded in 401 with his work titled Apology Against Rufinus. The bitter exchanges between the two men brought to an end their, their lifelong, but as Kelly puts it, increasingly fragile friendship. Kelly says that in the end, Rufinus chose simply to ignore Jerome. For example, Rufinus translated Eusebius' ecclesiastical history from Greek into Latin, even adding two more books, taking the story to the death of Theodosius I up to the year 395, noting leading men of his day. But uh, when he did that, he chose simply to omit any mention at all of Jerome. Uh, Kelly adds, Jerome's behavior, however, was very different. He says that to the end of Rufinus's life, and Rufinus would die in 411 uh, during the barbarian um, invasions of Italy, that uh, even after Jerome had died, Jerome continued to pursue him with contempt and insults. Rather than call Rufinus by name, Jerome referred to him as the scorpion and the grunting pig. Several months after Rufinus's death, Jerome would high-mindedly write to a monk urging him 
quote, never speak evil to anyone. And then he would proceed after that pious sentiment in the very same letter, viciously to attack uh, Rufinus as the grunting pig. Again, Kelly uh, sees things like this in Jerome and doesn't come away with a real high view of Jerome's personal character. While still engaged in anti-origin polemics and ecclesiastical intrigues that would include the removal of John Chrysostom from the office of bishop at Constantinople at the Senate of the Oak in 403, Kelly calls attention to a renewal of correspondence in this period, that is the early 400s, between Jerome and Augustine of Hippo. Augustine wrote to question uh, Jerome's preference for the Hebrew over the Old Latin and the Septuagint, and also to, to challenge some of his scriptural interpretations, like his attempt to downplay the conflict between Paul and Peter in Galatians 2. Kelly notes how uh, when Jerome replied to Augustine's queries, that once again his letters showed that he suffered from uh, being morbidly suspicious and that his letters to Augustine took on what Kelly calls a surly tone. The relationship between Jerome and Augustine might well have ended with the same type of rupture uh, that had uh, a, uh, come upon the friendship with Rufinus. Uh, so says Kelly, were it not for Augustine's magnanimous spirit. And whereas um, Kelly says that Jerome, again, continued to be surly, uh, he praises Augustine for his uh, peaceful attitude um, during their correspondence when they had these disagreements. And he points in particular to a letter known as Augustine's Letter 102J, and Kelly calls that letter marvelously self-effacing and conciliatory. And so the friendship was saved uh, not because of the um, humility and diplomacy of Jerome, but because of uh, the conciliatory spirit of Augustine. Jerome suffered a devastating blow uh, in the year 404, January the 26th of 404, when his longtime friend and collaborator in the monastic community, Paula, died at age 56. Kelly says that Jerome was shattered by her death. Paula was, to use Kelly's words, one of very few people in the world, perhaps the only one for whom Jerome felt tenderness and affection. For months, Jerome could write nothing. Finally, however, he composed a great threnody for Paula in the form of a, a consolatory letter to her daughter, Eustochium. This, Kelly says, was the longest and perhaps most splendid of Jerome's letters of this sort. Jerome was later brought back to life by the task of translating the rule of Pacomius, the supposed founder of Egyptian monasticism, in order to help Eustochium as she took over the duties of her departed mother in directing the women's house in Bethlehem. By 405, Kelly says that Jerome set the seal on the most ambitious and successful of his literary enter enterprises, the translation or revision of the Old Testament on the basis of the Hebrew. Again, the work had been done in stages over the course of some 14 years, from roughly the year 391 up to the year 405. Kelly observes, quote, throughout Jerome had had stuck lo loyally to the Hebrew canon, never deigning to touch the so-called apocrypha or deuterocanonical books, end quote. But now he decided at the request of friends to add his translations of the books of Tobit and Judith. Jerome also had an abiding interest in the proper text of the Psalms, and this is reflected in his correspondence, particularly between the years 404 and 410. 
And one letter that is intriguing in this regard is letter 106, in which Jerome responds to questions that have been raised uh, by inquirers as to his earlier so-called Gallican Psalter, which he had based on Origen's Hexapla, uh, and questions about that and the text of the Psalms and the Septuagint. Kelly notes that with respect to the Psalms, and given their use in liturgy, quote, Jerome was somewhat prepared to prefer a reading consecrated by tradition and church usage to one required by the Hebrew, end quote. That's page 286. And this is an interesting insight. Um, what it's saying is that Jerome believed that the, the proper translation of the Old Testament was to be from the Hebrew. But uh, when it came to the Psalms, given their use in the liturgy, uh, he was more influenced by what we could call ecclesiastical usage um, to uh, accept readings that weren't necessarily uh, affirmed by uh, just looking at the Hebrew. Around the year 404, a new polemical skirmish erupted when Jerome received, wor received word of a man in Gaul named Vigilantius, who was criticizing the cult of the martyrs uh, in that region. Vigilantius's critiques of so-called exotic forms of Christian piety in many ways seems to anticipate later Protestant concerns. Kelly lists at least five points made by Vigilantius in criticism of these so-called exotic forms of Christian piety that were found throughout Gaul at this time. First, he questioned as superstitious the devotion to the remains of the martyrs or relics and other holy persons, as well as prayers to saints and martyrs and the lighting of candles to them in shrines. Second, he denounced frequent all-night vigils at these shrines and questioned the supposed miracles that claimed to have been done there. Third, he protested against extreme ascetic ideals, monasticism, the elevation of virginity, and the celibate clergy. Uh, fourth, he called for an end of sending offerings to Jerusalem um, to support uh, the so-called idle army of monks there. I said there were five, but there I just listed four points. Kelly notes that we no longer have any of Vigilantius's writings that are extant, but we know them only from a pamphlet that Jerome wrote to oppose Vigilantius, and that is known as Against Vigilantius. Uh, Kelly describes this pamphlet as short and vulgarly abusive. Kelly continues, Rarely mealy-mouthed in controversy, Jerome surpassed himself in his against Vigilantius in sheer coarseness and personal insinuation. In this, as Kelly puts it, unpleasant fly sheet produced in a single night, the poor man's name, which literally means wide awake, that's what Vigilantius means, is twisted by Jerome ad nauseum, uh, who calls the man repeatedly sleepyhead, and he lampoons the prose style of his opponent. Vigilantius is attacked uh, in this pamphlet with ad hominem arguments. He's accused of being a drunkard and a glutton because he opposed asceticism, and he's ridiculed for being the son of an innkeeper, being someone of low birth. So uh, again, uh, Kelly is interesting in that he doesn't have a high view of um, Jerome's personal character, particularly as it was expressed in some of these polemical clashes. More substantive among the writings of Jerome in this period uh, were his expositions or commentaries on uh, Zechariah, Malachi, Hosea, Joel, and Amos. Thus, uh, Jerome was able to complete uh, around the year 406 uh, a task that had taken 14 years. Uh, he had completed his commentaries on the minor prophets. 
Kelly calls attention to one particularly eloquent paragraph in Jerome's commentary on the book of Zechariah, in which the now aged Jerome reflects on old age, and he draws what uh, Kelly calls a portrait of himself now in his middle 70s and ruefully conscious of his years, which for a moment, Kelly says, he lays bare in this eloquent paragraph his guilt-ridden psychology. Old age, Jerome says, brings both blessings and misfortunes, while sensual desires decrease, bodily illnesses increase. Jerome's reflections uh, conclude, quote, when one is old, the spark now and then glows among the burnt out ashes and tries to come to life, but it cannot get the blaze going, end quote. In 407, Jerome completed his commentary on the book of Daniel, and from the years 408 to 410, he worked on Isaiah, the most voluminous of all his commentaries. In August of the year 410, a cataclysmic uh, political and social uh, event occurred in Rome, and that Rome was sacked by the barbarians, and this sent the Roman world into panic, terror, chaos, and confusion. News reached Jerome in Bethlehem of the death of many of his dearest friends who were slaughtered by the barbarians in Rome and in Italy, and many had their property destroyed. Jerome and those who were with him in Bethlehem watched uh, with concern and in a state of numbness, Jerome suspended all of his work, much as he had uh, as he grieved the death of Paula. About a year later, by 411, Jerome was resuming his writing once again. Uh, he began working on a commentary on the book of Ezekiel, uh, but his writing of this commentary was often interrupted because in the aftermath of the fall of Rome, there were now a flood of refugees uh, who were coming uh, toward Palestine. There had also been correspondingly an invading horde of Arabs from the south, and so there was pressure both from the west and the east, threats that were coming uh, against Palestine. In the end, Jerome was so harried with his work and duties that he could only take time in the evenings at night uh, to, to work on his commentary on uh, Ezekiel. Uh, and to him and to many at that time, it seemed as though the world was coming to an end. Chapter 26 of Kelly's biography of Jerome, of 28 chapters, is titled The Last Controversy. The final controversy uh, in Jerome's life, according to his biographer Kelly, was precipitated by the arrival of Pelagius in Palestine, he also having been pushed uh, eastward by the fall of Rome. Pelagius' uh, teachings uh, were, were known by Jerome. He had refuted them uh, in a series of letters and now having completed his commentary on Ezekiel uh, by the year 414 or 415, uh, Jerome began to work on a commentary on Jeremiah, although he would never complete that commentary. He did, however, complete a polemical work against Pelagius that is titled Dialogue Against the Pelagians. And so there was a bitter polemical uh, dispute between Jerome and Pelagius. In the year 416, a mob of hooligans, perhaps those who were supporters of Pelagius, attacked the Latin monasteries in Bethlehem and destroyed their building with fire. Jerome was only able to escape harm by fleeing to a defensive tower. And although eventually uh, these uh, Latin or Western monasteries in Palestine were defended by the Bishop of Rome, the atmosphere uh, remained menacing. 
Kelly notes that the last few years of Jerome's life are hidden behind a wall of silence. He apparently remained in Bethlehem in reconstructed quarters, uh, still uh, preoccupied with the menace of the Pelagians. By the year 418 or 419, Eustochium, Jerome's spiritual daughter, had died. And much as with the death of her mother, Paula, this also was a crushing blow to Jerome, who is now a very aged man. The final letter, the last known letter that we have from Jerome is referred to as letter 154, in which he's writing to uh, someone named Donatus. And in that letter, uh, last extant letter we have from the pen of Jerome, uh, he is writing against the Pelagians, uh, urging that they must be wiped out, and they must be spiritually slaughtered. Kelly notes, quote, with this ferocious but characteristic outburst of fanatical intolerance, Jerome disappears from our view, end quote, page 331. In his letters, uh, in his, his final correspondence, Jerome appears, according to Kelly, as an aging and broken, yet still vigilant man. Prosper of Aquitaine, in his chronicle, would place the death of Jerome as being having occurred on September the 30th of the year 420, when Jerome was age 91. This may or may not be accurate. Another source of the same era puts his death on the same day, September 30th, but a year earlier in the year 419. Kelly says that he can find no reason to reject the year 420, however, as the appropriate death date for Jerome, conceding, however, we are in fact completely ignorant of the circumstances of his death. Jerome was buried in the grottos of the Church of the Nativity, near the final resting places of Paula and Eustochium. The final uh, section uh, of Kelly's biography is titled Epilogue. It's chapter 28, and it's just a couple pages long, pages 333 to 336. And if you don't have time to read the entirety of the biography, I would encourage you at least to, to read the, these, these, this last chapter, this epilogue. Uh, here's the way it begins. Kelly writes, For most of his adult life, Jerome had been the focus of bitter controversy, as passionately detested in some circles as loved and admired in others. By the time he died, the suspicion and hostility he had aroused had begun to die down, and for the next thousand years and more, a crescendo of adulation was to surround him. That's the way that last chapter begins. Kelly points out that uh, after Jerome's death, that uh, there were produced in later years various apocryphal lives of Jerome that were written extolling his sanctity, his piety, even his, his ability to work miracles. He has been acclaimed alongside of Ambrose and Augustine and Gregory the Great, as one of the four so-called doctors of the Western Church. In the Middle Ages, his remains were taken from Bethlehem to Italy so that they could be venerated. In the Renaissance period, he was hailed as a great uh, scholar by the humanists. Erasmus called him the Christian Cicero, and Erasmus became the first to collect Jerome's writings uh, together to create a sort of collected works of Jerome. Kelly points out that Jerome inspired various artists from the 13th to the 19th centuries who presented him often accompanied by a docile lion taken from an apocryphal story of Jerome healing a lion by taking a thorn from its paw. He was also presented in art of the Middle Ages as a cardinal of the church with a red hat and a mantle, although he was never appointed as a, as a cardinal. He's also presented in art as an emaciated pennant in the desert, although, as was pointed out by Kelly in, his bi in the biography, 
Uh, he actually only had a short sojourn in the desert. Uh, and, and Kelly points out that rather than being someone who reveled in being alone, Jerome was a talkative man with a craving for company. Uh, Jerome is also often depicted in visual art as a scholar in his study, and sometimes he's depicted in visual art as a dying man receiving his last communion. Kelly says that Jerome was not in the end a creative theologian or a creative exegete who deserves, in Kelly's opinion, the title of being a doctor of the church, but uh, he adds that Jerome's Vulgate Bible and his great series of commentaries rendered an incalculable service to Western Christendom. Jerome was, according to Kelly, the best equipped Christian scholar of his day and would be the best such scholar for centuries to come. Uh, however, Kelly says that Jerome was held back by his vanity and his tendency in his work uh, to rush uh, to get things into print, and this sometimes made his work slipshod and careless. Uh, he points out that the key decision of Jerome's uh, scholarly work was his decision to go back to the Hebrew verity. He also claims that Jerome became a chief architect of Western monasticism and Catholic spirituality. Uh, he must also be admired, according to Kelly, for his literary achievement. As Rome crumbled, quote, he emerged as one, as one of the great Latin stylists trained in the rhetoric of the schools, but adapting it to Christian purposes, end quote. As a man, Kelly concludes, Jerome presents a fascinating puzzle. No other famous Christian figure of his age had such a complex, curiously ambivalent personality. He could, according to Kelly, be warm-hearted, kind to the poor and distressed, but also vain and petty, jealous of rivals, morbidly sensitive and irascible, hag-ridden of imaginary fears. He seems, according to Kelly, to have been a genuine Christian, but with, a, with fundamental flaws of character, so that in the end, there is, according to Kelly, an unsolved enigma about the real Jerome. Well, uh, this brings to an end my survey of my notes on Kelly's Jerome, his life, writings, and controversies. I think in the end, we can agree with uh, Kelly that uh, probably the two greatest achievements of Jerome was, first of all, his advocacy for the Hebrew verity, for uh, the, the, the original Hebrew being the authoritative um, language um, of the Hebrew Bible from which it should be studied and from which it should be translated in vernacular translations. And also in that regard, um, uh, his decision to stick with the Hebrew original also had uh, ramifications for canon in that he accepted only the Hebrew canon and rejected uh, the ecclesiastical or apocryphal works that had been incorporated into the Septuagint. Uh, the second of his crowning achievements would be his Latin Vulgate translation, uh, translating the Bible into Latin. And uh, we could say from a text critical perspective, it was key in that uh, this translation helped preserve some of the traditional um, readings uh, in the, the New Testament in particular, like the traditional ending of Mark and the woman taken in adultery passage. So uh, we have completed, we went a little, little more quickly in this part two, our survey of the life of Jerome, Jerome taking uh, in the second part his life from uh, his residency in Bethlehem up to his death. I hope that uh, this uh, two-part series, Word Magazine 173 and 174, has been helpful and edifying in understanding the life of this very important person in Christian history and in church history and in 
the history of the transmission of the Christian scriptures. Again, hope this has been helpful, and I will look forward to speaking to you in the next Word magazine. Till then, take care and God bless.